Tonight, in this intimate setting, we welcome Sean Penn. He's uh, been one of cinema's most esteemed actors, virtually from the moment he first appeared on movie screens as a high school military cadet in 1981's Taps. He is a five-time nominee for Best Actor at the Academy Awards and a two-time winner, uh, once for his searing portrayal of a grief-stricken father of a murder victim in 2003's Dennis Lehane adaptation Mystic River, and also for his title role in 2008's Milk, capturing Harvey Milk's remarkable rise to political office in San Francisco as an openly gay man before his tragic assassination in 1978. But that's certainly not all. Uh, with the book he's here to present tonight as your first item of evidence. Uh, he's also directed five feature films, three of those written by him as well, uh, as suffused as his other work has been with complicated humanity and deep commitment to exploring the dark sides and occasionally hopeful sides of the United States psyche, uh, whether it's the story of two Nebraskan brothers torn in very different directions by the events of the 1960s and 1991's The Indian Runner, or whether it's uh, an epic dive into the natural world and into the lives of other American outcasts that Chris McCandless takes in Penn's acclaimed adaptation of John Krakauer's Into the Wild. Penn's first novel, Bob Honey, Who Just Do Stuff, takes a radically different, more absurdist approach to similar political societal concerns in the Trump era. Debuting in slightly different form as a free audiobook in 2016, in the midst of all of the election coverage, it tells the story of an everyday American worker who sidelines as a contract killer, weeding the country of those deemed to be non-contributors. And, and truly, check expectations, any expectations you may have before opening the book, my advice is just to dive into it, open the book, let all of the verbal theatrics trip over your tongue. It's a uniquely alive experience to read, whether that's aloud or in your head. It's something of a Terry Southern novel for the 21st century. Uh, and today, we're honored to have Penn joined in conversation by Laura Whitman, who is really one of the most beloved writers in the politics and prose community. She's a former reporter for the Baltimore Sun. She's the creator of the iconic Tess Monahan series of detective novels set in her home city of Baltimore. And she's written 10 other books besides those, most recently Sunburn, which is a fantastic noir set in nearby Delaware that you'll find very comfortably sitting among our store's staff picks. She was here for that book in February. An audio of that event should be online later this week. Uh, so with that, please help me in welcoming both authors to Politics and Prose. Um, I'm going to begin tonight in this conversation about your book and its influences and just this whole journey you've been on with a quote. I think you might know it, maybe not. The American writer has his hands full in trying to understand and then describe and then make credible much of the American reality. It stupefies, it sickens, it infuriates. The culture tosses up figures almost daily that are the envy of every novelist. Do you know that quote? I don't, but my, you'll find that my retention is minute. Is, well, the funny thing about it, though, is that that's Philip Roth writing in 1961. <laughs> but it never seems to get old. And so I want to start off with just a question about the challenge of writing contemporary fiction now. You started this in 2016 where it had a life as, as an audio version that was a bit more performance-based. And, you know, you know, a bit more, but it's still... And then you had the chance to revise and expand on it for its public. I mean, it, it, it struck me that you were still making revisions maybe within six months of publication date because you had a reference to the events in Vegas. Right up to the last minute, yeah. So how did you, in particular with this book that is so very much rooted in the times we live in now, respond to that challenge of Every novelist I know right now is a little bit insane trying to deal with writing fiction about contemporary times. How did you deal with that? Well, there's sort of two answers to that. One, one is that because I, I knew I was going to be writing very, very currently because the, the building idea of a novel was really about the last 15 or 20 years of the culture and that it was going to be 
all played out in this period of time that where in terms of an, a writer driving themselves crazy, I, for me it was in stepping away from the news I was watching and reading that was making me crazy was, the, was what wrote this book. I mean, that's actually one of Bob Honey's central pro problems and that he reflects on it, which is that even an hour with television news makes you feel kind of crazy right now. And that's like on either side of the partisan divide that we're in. Yeah, I think it's, it's all that has become normalized. And bit by bit, when one, and we, I don't know when it was that we passed the sort of Patty Chayefsky, I'm mad as hell moment. But, but I'm, I'm mad now is not a reference to anger. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, do you, do you allow yourself much of a diet of the television news channels? Do you try to restrict it? Do you find that it makes you crazy? Do you get addicted to it and you can't get enough of it? Yeah, the way that I do it is I, I wait until I'm going to bed. I have a first drink and an Ambien. <laughs> and I watch it and as I feel I'm falling out, I switch to forensic files and let that play in my head all night long. But do, do you literally actually keep the TV on and sort of keep that audio going? I mean, I'm curious because that's something, I, I, when I'm alone, I like that some kind of audio is seeping in, which can make for very odd dreams. Yeah, and I, will, I would say I don't like it, but it I, and I don't plan to do it, but it seems that what I don't plan happens virtually every night. And, <laughs> You know, one of, one of the reasons I wanted to do this interview when I was, you know, asked by politics and pros is because through my husband's work, I know a lot of actors, and I know that um, many actors are incredibly intelligent, socially aware, and it seems to me more than any other group of people, they're the ones who are told, stay in your lane. Don't try to be, don't try to have an opinion about politics. Don't try to have an opinion about world affairs. Don't, don't do things. I mean, you're someone who, and, and then don't write novels. It, it's this kind of insistent, I think more than most people, and more than most people in the entertainment industry, they're told, you're not allowed to do this. Go back to doing what we like you doing. And, and talk a little bit about how you've dealt with that and how you've clearly rejected it. Well, I mean, I've, I've thought about this a lot. I thought about... You know, I'm I'm kind of I well I am I'm 57 and my pool is heated, and so I I don't have it, you know and and writing. What's well, great, you know, I had written uh, adapted and written original screenplays, right. and when you're writing a screenplay, you can come to that moment where you, you know, well to a screen direction, where you take it from say a manageable budget to something into the stratosphere with one sentence. And over time, I realized that you can't but self-censor. And, and, and be, because you're going to realize, you, you know this is going to cost $100 million to shoot this scene. And, and, or you don't imagine such a scene. And, and in writing a book, you, you just go where it takes you. And so the part about staying in one's lane, I've always felt that I rejected that, but it wasn't until I saw what I felt was the prime example of somebody not staying in their lane, um, who lives down the street he here now, um, <laughs> <laughs> that I thought, well, okay, I, I'm, 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 I'm this part of the example I'll follow, but this is the thing that actually I've always wanted to do more than anything else. And so now I'm doing it, writing a, a book. And, and I had a blast, and it's been a blast right on through. So um, the, the, I was, somebody had said, because it was getting these savage reviews, which I have to say, I expected them, and I expected them exactly as they came. And, and I thought, as they came, I'm definitely writing another one. And then <laughs> it's, 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 Was there ever a discussion from anyone, whether within family, friends, or within publishing, 
to say, okay, why don't you do this under a pseudonym so you can get an honest read on how it will be received? Yeah, well, in fact, that's, I would say that's part of what started this book because it was not so much that it was originally when I did the Audible that it was performance related. It was that I had not met the publishing world yet. And when I went to meet the publishing world, I realized that I like to think of it as Spain because it takes these siestas you can't believe. It <laughs> moves so slowly. And in, in anything I'd ever been involved with professionally, everything had to be done yesterday. And I loved my experience in, in this. Nonetheless, when I started writing it, I thought, oh, it might be nice to get it out before the election in any way that it would have some small conversation piece within it or so on. And of course, I'm, I did know about myself that I could be guilty of uh, expecting things to be understood by osmosis. And so I would do my draft as, as though I was the only reader and hurried it out on an on, on audible. And then once, um, I, as it turns out, it didn't affect the election. Um, <laughs> or, or did it? Or, 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 <laughs> I, well, we could turn on the TV and see James Comey's interview right now. Um, see what he, um, but it, it. But then I thought, you know, I, I, I do know of the full version of this, and I needed to go back and do that. And uh, I, I just loved do, doing it, and uh, so now it, uh, it goes. You, you've talked about the, the delightful discovery that being a novelist is much more of a one-person thing as opposed to a team sport or a collaboration. But were you, so you were surprised at how long it takes a novel to get out there in the world. Like that was part of it, right? You were like, you should be able to do this in a month, two months? <laughs> well, he, he, I was surprised at the temperament of the people that I ran into in, in this world and, and came to really appreciate it. I had a really great first experience with an editor, um, very encouraging and all of that. Um, I realized that I didn't really answer your other question about the, the pseudonym part because what had happened is I had published what became a less than popular article about Chapo Guzman in Mexico prior to this, an article that I still stand by and that I know most critics of it did not read it and that there becomes this regurgitation of sound bites from things or, or excerpts from things and that those who did read it, again, are very, I think, my, my opinion about it is that they're very, um, we still as a, as a system are very, very inclined to focus on um, the supply side and, and the drug issue. And so when I, when I felt like I really gave that my all and, and, it, and it got very, you know, virtually slaughtered, um, I felt like I didn't want my name to, to be the baggage of this book initially. And so at the same time, by way of process, whatever that music that's coming into your head in terms of the storyteller, not the principal character in this, I, I gave him a name, and he's a character in the book, and uh, and so I originally released it under that name. Right, we're talking about Pappy Pariah, who yeah. does show up very late in the book, and you initially went out in 2016 and told a story about meeting Pappy in Key West in 1979. This is such a, a small personal question. Did you really go to the Key, Key West Literary Seminar? Did you actually go to that literary festival? No. no. That, I was like, wow, that's so impressive. That, that was from, uh, <laughs> there's a writer, James Leo Hurley, who had mm -hmm. written a play called Terrible Jim Fitch, and he talked about meeting the girl at the Lavender Fawn, Fawn in Key West, Florida, and so that's where the whole thing came from. Oh, that's, that's wonderful to know, but I was, I see again, I, I kind of bought into part of the origin story. I want to start with your character, Bob Honey, and who he is the nature of which his job as someone who deals in waste management, sewer construction, the extent to which that is an intentional, allegorical, symbolic detail. But also, I mean, I'm really curious about Bob and what Bob yearns for and what animates him and what drives him as someone, you know, as someone who has read the book. To, I always like go back and say, what is at the top of my mind. What image will I carry away from this book? 
And the image I carry away from this book is Bob dancing by himself in that motel room in New Orleans. To me, that seemed like a very significant, poignant moment, a moment when he's seeing himself and allowing himself to be seen, if only by himself. So I, I'm really curious about Bob, and I've seen one review that invoked a character, and I know you don't like to talk about influence as a direct thing, but it was hard not to think about Ignatius Riley and Confederacy of Dunces. So to the extent that I'm right or wrong about that, I've seen one other reviewer who thought it was just assured that Confederacy of Dunces was something that you might be thinking of. When, but I want to know about Bob Honey. Tell me about Bob Honey. Well, the, the, the Confederacy of Dunces part of it, you know, I told you early on that my retention is not so great. I recall that I have read that book. I don't recall in detail, but then when I, when I did f get to where I was finishing this book, I, uh, one of my, somebody who was assisting me getting it into the computer showed me some, it wasn't comparative writing so much, but some things that were from the book, from uh, the Confederacy of Dunces, and, and I, I, I did wish that I had written them. Um, so that's what I, so I, could, I would say that, you know, influences are like that, I suppose, where over the years, but I don't think that the influences of my experience to date, which is a brand new thing as in writing a novel, but it, it, I don't know how uh, literary influences ever f figure into it more than every influence, that everything that comes in to you, you're taking from in some way. And, and, or spurned on by in some way. But the part that you mentioned about Bob dancing, I think there's this thing that happens where as you get older and, you've, and you, you recognize, especially, you know, because we're in ch very challenged times to consider hope without considering that you're hoping against hope and um, that um, losing my train of thought a little bit, but this, the, the, the dancing, I think, represents as much as anything that in the part of ideal, one's own idealism, um, there's also in pursuing ideals and in kind of getting very battered for it in, in a life, and, and the idealism getting battered. But the idealism becomes kind of synonymous with the innocence, and that in this kind of the world of this novel, so much of it because I wanted to be laughing about everything, including language, and the kind of pursuing language to the point of a kind of ridiculousness, because even language was another thing that had sort of been beaten into submission in this culture, in, in, in you broadly, um, perhaps not so much in, in a group of people who, who would frequent a bookstore. But if you're just watching television um, or just texting and, and so on, language takes a real big beating every day. So it all was kind of like my f funny ride into an innocence. And, and in that, I think, was this, this piece of the book that you're talking about. Well, you, know, you talked about language, and that's an interesting aspect of your book, where you seem to be choosing sort of two distinct styles. There are moments in Bob's journey that are extremely simple and poignant. These, these little just straightforward things that jump out. For some reason, I'm thinking about the point in the text where he makes a cross-country drive that he observes that some towns seem to exist only to hold prisons. And, these, and, these, and then there is a much more um, baroque, magisterial tone, um, you clearly have an affinity for alliteration, and I'm just wondering stylistically, to what extent were you working by, by instinct and just this is what feels right to me, and to what extent were you, you intentionally blending those two very different voices? Yeah, there is a, a navigation of this book, and the, one of the reasons that I've, you know, what, it, what was funny to me and, and, and I don't mind confessing, is I don't know that I would have had the patience for this book 
as a reader. Oh, that's so interesting. I don't know. Wow, that's because I really, really, they have a very, uh, there was a very disciplined map to all of that. And there were times where I parted ways with the map just because it fought to, to do that. Um, but it is, you know, it is, it's footnoted fiction. Some of the footnotes are um, meant less earnestly than others. <laughs> um, and you know, there's, there's a thing I've realized in framing this and in talking to people about this book. I kind of, the, I used to watch a lot the surgery channel on television. And with the exception of the eyes or genitals or pediatric surgeries, and notwithstanding the hardship of the person going through the surgery, I always found it kind of hysterical to watch them. My kids, when they were growing up, would, would come into where I had it on television, and I was laughing almost to the point of tears. And they thought that they would, and I resented it being con considered a nervous laughter because I knew that it wasn't that. I knew that what it was is that, you know, this is at the end of the day, we're all made up of that. You can see inside, it's pretty much the same with everybody. And, and that we, we get, it, it just seemed like a great counterpoint. And then, when, when it got to the point where I was in tears laughing, was when it was voluntary cosmetic surgery. And it's so violent, and they you know, take the skin flap back, and they're shoving things in, and, or blowing something up, or all of this. And you see the person who's completely anesthetized, bouncing around with this <laughs> for vanity. And I kind of, it, it's, so this book is as funny as that. <laughs> <laughs> So many directions to go in. Um, I want to go to a point, and I, I told you we were chatting before that um, instead of reading, instead of watching every interview that you've done on this book tour, I watched one, but then I tried to like sort of find some unusual veins to mine. And I went back and read a profile of you that appeared in the New Yorker more than a decade ago. And one of the things I was really struck by is you talked about in your early acting classes. You had an acting teacher who had you graph your scenes and that you sort of warred with that as someone who believed in instinct. I don't even know what it means for an actor to graph his or her scenes, but I'd love to know if that sort of graphing discipline versus your instincts, if that was something that also came up in writing a novel, if you were also... I know how to do this instinctively, but at the same time, I also know that I need a plan. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's fair to say that writers come to things, you know, all in, in a variety of ways. This is the first time, while I've had some very close friendships with some great writers, I realized that I didn't spend a lot of those friendships talking about writing or about acting. And that now I'm on this, you know, going around talking to writers about this book. Uh, I've had conversations where I'm, y y the same way I might be able to see a performance in a movie and sit down with that actor or actress afterwards and really have a sense of how they approached it and vice versa. Because we've all, as actors, been in that conversation together. I realize that a lot of things are being articulated for me my senses of how I approach this in, in talking to writers because they, you all have been in that game for a while. And so, it, and it's been fascinating to do that. What I would say is that in this case, like I said, I originally approach it very much in the kind of tangential way that I speak and often gets either uh, interrupted or, or walked away from. Well, it does. I mean, that's, which is, you know, the response, the onus is on me. Um, but, uh, that first draft was that. And then this navigation I talked about and the graphing really came. So I wrote the book, the origin of the book, in about 30 days. And it took me two years of rewriting and, and graphing. So the way I would do that, because it's a short book also, I don't know how the process would be for me with a very long book. Because I have to go back each day and read everything from page one aloud to start the next 
bit. So it's a lot of reading and writing. Oh, that sounds almost Sisyphean. You're sitting down and starting at the beginning every day and reading up to what you have, or just reading yesterday's well, work? Now that you've said that, it seems to me that what's Sisyphean is, is a very current book. <laughs> Because that it, it, everything feels that way, and that is this, this. It is that because also, I'm reading it, well, having knowing that I I want this. My whole one of the, like someone else might write or paint a sunrise. This stage that we're in is very current, and I was writing immediately reflective of it, and so that's. I wanted to make sure that once I sent it off to print, that as a whole it would have represented that period. One of the risks that you take on in writing a book like this, and this is true of anyone who writes um, a character like Bob Honey, a character like Ignatius Riley, is this confusion of writer and character. And a lot of people went straight to Sean Penn says, Sean Penn believes. And, you know, Bob Honey has some unattractive views of the world. Would you agree with that, by the way? Well, I, w I, w I would share a view that Bob Honey has. The, oh, okay. And, and, I'm for, and, 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 you know, as, as you know, um, the elderly uh, are not as active on social media as others, which makes them a, a lesser contributor to globalization and, and global economies. And, and there's the, the addition of flatulence that diminishes, degrades the, the, the ozone. And so Bob understandably helps to cull the elderly. Um, and, and so if, if it is so that that can be attributed to me, um, I'm confused at its interpreter. But, but that's what Bob believes. Right, no, that's what Bob believes. But, but you had, to, you have, I mean, I think there's a moment. By the way, he calls them with a polo mallet, in case it's not clear how the calling is going. There is a moment, I think, for most writers of fiction, and it's, it's always been with us. You can go back to Philip Roth, who dealt with this moment by writing, finally saying, fine, I'm going to tell you my true story so you can know every single fact about me. And I actually believe it was this like brilliant experiment in which he purposely wrote the most boring memoir ever. I mean, if you've read the facts, I mean, I think it's intentionally meant to make you embarrassed that you ever had any curiosity about the personal life of the writer. I mean, you had to know, as a person who's already well known, writing your first novel, that you were going to, it, it was just like you couldn't help it. You're, you're going to be conflated somehow with your characters, with your prose. Did that make you bolder? Did that make you first feel like, you know, WTF, I'm going for it? Because whatever happens, people are going to find something to pick on. Yeah, you know, the other thing is that I had gotten, I mean, in, answer, in answering that, I had gotten less, I was enjoying the collaborative experience less. And you, there's not a time that you can function in movies that isn't collaborative. And in fact, if I, I felt that the, the biggest strength anybody can offer it is the part of them that is collaborative. So you do that, but when you realize you're not enjoying doing that anymore, when you're not playing well with others uh, willfully, um, then it was time to, to do this. When I decided to do this, what I realized, and why I, another part of what felt very freeing was not just the writing process, it was getting to a point of realizing the liberation I had of also not having the responsibility to others on it in that sense. I knew that what I was writing was meant to be shared, but that was voluntarily shared. Not all of these people that you wake up and work with for months on end on a movie or the financiers or any of the people involved where you really feel um, you, there's a lot of uh, responsibility in, in a different way. And in this case, once I realized it was all mine, and then the publisher who reads it, reads a finished piece in essence, and so it's not kind of a theoretical, here's how this movie's gonna look and how it's gonna feel. It's more, we're gonna re refine this together, but you're really seeing the, the final cut of the movie when you decide to, to put money into 
publishing it and all of that. So I had no nobody else to worry about but but, but me on that. And um and so there, all of the concern about what the pre uh, the, the sort of um, prejudging or, or, or all or the attribution and all of that, I, it really was, it reminded me of a conversation I'd had with the writer Harry Cruz once where I had bought the, the rights to one of his books. I was trying to make a movie out of it and I said to him, I said, gee, Harry, I really hope I don't screw this thing up. And he says, you can't screw up my book, man. It's in 2,000 goddamn libraries. So <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, this is, with a, with a book, the reader is the director. I've offered the the music as I've heard it, and and it can be read as anybody chooses to or or did not. And that includes those who want to, you know, attribute it to. The, I have nothing I can do about that. Yeah. So. I, I'm real quick. How many people here know the writer Harry Cruz? Oh wow, he's one. Of, he's one of the great Florida writers. I mean, one of the great Southern writers. And maybe even saying Southern isn't fair and a famous figure, and he was a mentor to a writer I love named Sterling Watson. Um, yeah, you even had Cruz do a cameo in a film. Which film was that? It was The Indian Runner. That's right. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I'm curious about is having been through the process of novel number one. In some ways, novel number two is the harder novel. You know, novel number one, you're sort of like got a lot of adrenaline going, and it's almost like a kid riding his riding his or her bike, you know, no hands down the street for the first time. And, and it's, th as you, you're, you're, are you deep into a second novel? Or I mean, how far, how far are you into the second one? Well, in my head, I'm deep into it. And, and on, pa on paper, I'm two pages into it. <laughs> but I'm feeling the same. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it, 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 it might as well have been a break in the same novel at this point, because it's, it, it's still this guy. Oh, so one of the things, and again, since you've, you know, you said you're kind of new to the writer conversation, and it sounds like a question that you think people don't want to know the answer to, but my experience is that people always want to ask the process question. They want to know what time of day you write. They want to literally know how you write, whether you choose, you know, a pen, a laptop. You know, they want to know those details, and I see people nodding. So tell me a little bit about your writing life, how you approach it. So... I, um, what it's come to look like, I, when I started writing in, in film, I wrote with a typewriter. And then when it went over to, you know, computers and all of that, I still to this day have never turned on a laptop computer. And that's a certain kind of lazy resistance and, a kind, and there's a lot of reasons why. But, um, but I, I've, uh, so I started uh, moving towards longhand at night and then I would typically take that into a session because I, I have an assistant that's worked with me for a long time who's pretty handy on the computer. So I can pace and smoke a cigarette and, and dictate, and I'll go on these runs. And a lot of times, for, and usually I'll say to that person, okay, we're going we're gonna to work for five hours today. And then at a certain point, that person's kind of looking at the clock four hours after that, and, and, and I get somebody else who can do, do the computer to come in and I'll use it. So I'll, I'll work kind of as long as I can until I'm too tired. And that could be 12 hours, it could be 30 hours, it just depends. And then go to, then go to sleep, putting some long hand down, and then uh, get up and do it again. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a lot of dictation though. Well, you know, Raymond Chandler dictated his novels. To a secretary, so there. I always, I always like to think about Pauline Kael because when she got Parkinson's, someone said to her, "Well, you know, you could use some sort of dictation," and she said, "I think I wrote as much with my hands as I ever did with my head." And I think whatever your process is, is your process, and deviating from it is really hard. What were the surprises for you writing this first novel? Were there moments in which Bob Honey? kind of said, no, I'm not going to do that, or I wouldn't do that, or did you end up in those kind of struggles that people, I mean, it's not so much that you're not the boss of your novel, but you've established your character, and then you try to make your character do something for a plot purpose. Did Bob Honey ever just kind of like stand up off the page and say, no, I wouldn't do that? Yeah, I think there were times that that happened. Um, but normally it would happen where, because the 
because there are two characters' voices principally, which is the storyteller, the storyteller's voice, and then Bob's, and and then these other couple characters, but principally those two. And what I would do is, like, as an as an actor in film, you may be working with somebody who is not giving you the surprises you want, either for them or for you, and and you may not to them, but. Uh, and it doesn't usually serve you very well to black, blank that out and do their performance in your head and react to the performance you're giving because you're going to have complimentary shots of both people and you want the organic thing of what's there. So you usually would go with what's there and hope to see what comes of that. In this case, I could be any and all of them. And what happens is that once you get to a point of understanding a character and the kind of music of it, you're not questioning anything and it's talking like itself through you. And you can immediately shift and go to the other one and you know what the other one is starting to think while you're talking. And you can start to, you, you know, you kind of own it all. And I, I loved that. It was, it was a, there was a, um, a, a book, I'll try to remember the name, it was about a multiple, The Lives of Billy Milligan. She's about a, a, a serial rapist, I think, at Michigan State University many years ago. And I think that once he got to court, they did not, they could not try him because they couldn't get the significant personality to testify. And so eventually, um, there was a screenplay that somebody did that it was ter terrifically, they narrowed it down to about seven personalities so that an audience could follow who you were with at the time. And I remember that the person directing it had intended to, to do, a, had already thought out the poster of it, and it, it was uh, this person alone in a straight jacket in a white room, and it said the crowded room. And, and so, not a, not, no attribution to serial rapist, but I liked as a writer being in my own crowded room. Oh no, I totally get what you're saying. As a matter of fact, and you made a really important distinction while you were talking about there's a storyteller, and there's Bob Honey. And one of the things I sometimes ask students to think about when I teach writing is, as an exercise, imagine why your story even exists. Now, some great novels, they actually do this in a very upfront, obvious way. The novel Alita is a written confession that Humbert Humbert is making that he says will not be released until... Um, Dolly Schiller is dead. And so you know, but it exists because he decided to write his confession. Um, did you have any idea about, so as you said, there's a storyteller and there's Bob. Do you know who, I mean, the storyteller is not you. I don't think it's you. Do you know who the storyteller is? Did you sort of have a concept of who would be the person to tell Bob's story? Yes, as defined by a kind of music in my head of how he spoke. Um, and then bit by bit, it starts to, to feed itself. I mean, I, even in film, I, I, I can see films that are approached, great films, and I know some great filmmakers who approach film that way, where that, uh, the understanding of why it exists is, is there. I was never personally of that school or, or, or interest as a filmmaker. I might be as an audience sometimes, but as a filmmaker, I was much more interested in saying, I will, th this whole thing is going to be a question. And, and if I get to an answer, that's fine. Now, in this case, it was more of an answer than any because, because part of the, to me, the, <laughs> the humor of this is the absolutism of what is, uh, what is Bob's moral compass and the kind of frailty of the moral compass of everything around him. So the more committed to that, it's kind of like when I talk as much, the, the book is designed as much as the, the, the times when, when someone is talking about explosives or, uh, or weapons in a technical way in the book. Because when you kind of consider it, you peel the onion, you peel the onion. If you think about a very technical explanation of a weapon, it should become, I don't mean in practice today, but philosophically, 
it should become very funny very fast because you're talking about something that should be part of a totally archaic violence, human to human. This, this machine that is, a, that is a, an assault rifle or that is an explosive, uh, this machine of death, it should be so far behind us. And in Bob, there is a kind of, that, there's that part of him, while very much in, 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 kind of conditioned by that world, is also struggling with that the only conversation should be a natural environment conversation. The only reason we should have to call another continent is to say, hey, how are the trees going over there because the wind's a little this today here. But instead, we're involved in all of this kind of, it goes back to the surgery channel <laughs> where, you know, when somebody is, 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 is there kind of getting their, you know, nose fixed or they're doing that stuff, that, that's funny. And were it not for the outcome, a technical examination of weapons should be ludicrous because there should be, it shouldn't even be in our psyche. But there was a, but there is this darker part of our nature that also drives the novel be, and drives the writer of the novel because it's in trying, it's, it, the whole attempt at write, with writing or anything expressive is to kind of peel that onion and to get to whatever one's aspirational core is, whether metaphorically or, or literally. I saw you express some ideas in, in that New Yorker interview about where does aggression and violence go when the need to be a hunter-gatherer has moved on and these old, I mean, I, I'm curious about how that fits in within the world of Bob Honey. Are, I mean, do you find that we have sort of this almost free-floating, toxic requirement for violence that's seeking some sort of way to address itself out, outside of, you know, if, if men aren't at war, and they're not hunting for their families, are you worried that it's almost like a free radical that has to express itself somewhere in one's life, or for cer a certain kind of man? Well, Norman Mailer at one point said that the, this, this may be the first century mankind does not complete. And I think that if that's a free radical determination, if that, y yes, I can consider that. And and we can all consider it. But if that's the case, the jig's up. Then, then yeah. the jig's up. So, and maybe it's up. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I, I, I would like uh, grandchildren of mine to have a life and so on, but I, I think it's possible that that won't happen. I think, you know, that, that hope is a proactive thing or it's nothing. Either, either we're going to do something real smart and really kind of spiritually smart, culturally smart, and, and we, I mean, we all, and instead what's happening, and what I a lot of talk about in the book a lot also, are these kind of divisiveness tends to create divisiveness. And movements create, are created of I versus we, and all of that stuff starts to get dangerously fashion-like. And so when you, you start looking at the bigger picture and you say, how do we prioritize and, and, and all of that, now, it seems like it's got to start with uh, the earth. And I was going to ask if you could fix one thing. If you could fix one huge macro problem, what would you choose? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I just for you know, discussion, I would bring up that the only explanation I have, the best explanation I can come up with about what seems to be an increasing trend towards a kind of... Um, disregard that, that uh, cultural and political leaders and, and the media seems to express for legacy. Nobody's covering their legacy as far as I can tell. I mean, broadly. It, these, the, there's, there's a lot of big partners in shame. Were we of a time where that legacy would be discovered as shameful? But I think there's a kind of, not a political problem, but a mental health problem across the board where people, consciously or not, are starting to consider that the apocalypse is near. Like, they're, they're, they're not, 
there's, there's no problem about what I do for me today because nobody's going to be there to look back on it. And I feel like this is subliminally, increasingly in the culture. And what happens is that it exponentially becomes the culture that way. Again, Mailer had a, he put out a book, it's probably in his store somewhere, called Why We're at War on the First Gulf War. And he said democracy is such a, an ideal principle, um, an ideal aspiration, this is, I'm just paraphrasing, that it's you know, imminently perishable, and if we don't hold on to it with all our might. And it seems that paradoxically, every time we try to export it, we tend to export it as fascism and creating more fascism at, at home. And, and I, I think these, all of these things have to be carefully considered uh, if we're gonna take these steps forward. And in Bob's world, he's on one end, he has a, a moral compass that's very tied to the environment, but there are certainly the same blinders that what may be attributable indirectly to me that I have in other ways, and that we all have in other ways. And it's, so you start to go back to that, you know, it is an essential question. Is it, are we animals, and it is, our, is, it, is it our predetermined nature to finally kill each other, or are we going to take, start at this is zero and make it a little better tomorrow? Yeah, Bob doesn't fit neatly into any established partisan camp right now. He wouldn't have a home in either of the major political parties. These, there's not going to be many people for, with which Bob is going to find agreement. You've mentioned Mailer a couple of times. I'm really curious, not about influences, but about what you read, fiction versus nonfiction, and whom you read. Well, I, I started reading what I was kind of had to read when I was in school. And, and, you know, in that public school journey in California at the time, uh, you stumble up upon things that you're really glad you read and, the, and, you, and you remember them. But you're damn well not going to read another one because that's mostly what somebody told you to read. And so then when I really started reading was later. Um, I, I, I think started when I started acting about 17, 18, 19. Uh, and then I, you know, usually because it was, you know, related to something I was doing in an acting class or something like that. And then I really got totally involved in, in fiction and I read um, a, a whole lot of, um, well, Bukowski kind of came later and that was a significant moment for me. But um, I started reading um, there was a, there's a book that I got, a, well, of course you start with you know, Catcher in the Rye comes in and all of that stuff and then you start to try to read the Russians and, <laughs> and it took me probably five years to actually get to Crime and Punishment and actually read it. Like, well, I, I started it many times but to actually read it and then I, I loved it you know, and then I thought well I'm not intimidated to read a thing like this. And so I, I kind of went on like this, and I discovered a lot of, you know, great writers. But I realized as I've been that, that most of them were male American writers that I ended up focusing my attention on. And it's only more in the last several years that I've started to to branch out from that. But at the same time, most of my reading has been taken over by nonfiction. So I've I, I've gotten somehow. Um, there are certain writers, a book comes out that I go and I grab it, I'll read it, and then it could be eight months of reading nothing but nonfiction before I read another book. But I, it's, I, I always have a tough time because I want to say the writer that most influenced the moment that I'm in the conversation with. I can't ever think of which one that would be at which time. No, understood. How did you find your way to the work of Harry Cruz? Because as our poll indicated, n uh, sadly not a well-known writer anymore. Yeah, well, I think I had read, um, he has a book, I'm sure they are in him, Feast of Snakes, I'd, I'd read, and then, and then a Karate is a Thing of the Spirit, and so now, I, and he had a great kind of tall tale teller thing about his work, and then I read uh, The Knockout Artist, and that really grabbed me, and that's when I started getting in touch with him about maybe making a movie uh, out of that, but that, he came... I think because I was reading something else and somebody said to me, hey, you should, if you like that, you're going to like this. Um, 
how did your kids affect what you read and what, I mean, they're adults now, but I'm just curious about if what they were reading in school brought you back to anything or if you circled back to something because all of a sudden you were watching your kids be assigned the classics that maybe had bored you the first time around or... Well, yeah, yeah, no, my, my daughter was immediately a reader. She, she ate books, uh, you know, when she started eating sugar. Um, and, and my son really kind of came around to it later. He's, he's been part of my nonfiction uh, reading because he's been really, uh, he's inspired some of the choices I've made in nonfiction because he pursues that more. Uh, yeah. What are you reading right now? Well... I'm, I, I can Sorry, say. I didn't mean to put you yeah, on the spot. <laughs> you know what I, I I did? What did I just uh, pick up? I just had um, um oh um uh, Hotel Honolulu, uh, Paul Theroux. Oh sure. Yeah, so I'm about twenty pages in on that. Well, I've fantastic so far. I've had the pleasure of being able to ask you so many questions. We're going to turn them over to some audience questions that we picked out. Um, the first one says you seem to have an extraordinary pinpoint focus with everything you do. Is this true? And if so, how do you do it? It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, and I'm, I'm terrible at stereophonic thinking, so I'm, you know, when you ask what I'm reading now, it's, I'm, 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 because I'm starting to write, I might get a book in before I start writing, but I can never do two things at once. Um, it's like whenever I was making a movie, I couldn't watch a movie. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I, to the degree that I'll take the accusation of pinpoint thinking, I can't imagine you <laughs> still think so. This question was asked before tonight started, right? <laughs> <laughs> thought so. What activity recharged your batteries best during the writing of this book? Yeah, laughing. Laughing, I laughed. I laughed a at lot. At surgery shows? No, no. At, <laughs> and my kids used to always complain to me that um, that you know, even when they thought I was saying something or doing something that was funny, that I would I would laugh. Well, you know, like a terrible skit comedian who's laughing at themselves during the skit. And it was true. I was. T I, I I just found myself first and foremost funnier than anyone else found me. Well, so I laughed a lot while I wrote this book. It's, it's funny because the next question is literally how often during the writing of this book did you laugh out loud? Can you hit a number? Um, he, he, here's the here's the good news because I've said some things that's prejudiced. This to, like you know, oh, he only he, he he thinks it's a totally inside joke. I did test this. And to see, and I, I saw that there were many people whose, whose minds and, and breadth of reading I respected a lot who got it, who understood the whole thing in and out. And, 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 and so I know it's there to be shared. But did I laugh throughout it? I did. <laughs> How would you describe your level of enjoyment doing these appearances in support of your book? Honestly, I've been having a blast. I've been. This is so. It's a, such a new thing. And um, uh, the, again, when you're talking about something, I, I can completely drift off in a conversation. Sometimes it's just a spectrum issue or something that I have. But uh, but I've come away from all the conversations again with this feeling, either by being in a room of readers and I'm sure writers also and talking to and you know there's something you go off and you're you are you're, you're having certain things articulated to you in in retrospect and so I I've just been having it's been a kick yeah. why a novel rather than a play or a screenplay I asked and answered. Um, I I do not play with others anymore well with others anymore I, I don't <laughs> it's I like to be alone in a room doing this, and that's it. Did the experience of writing this book help you in any way to deal with the current president? <laughs> well, the, you know, this is funny because there's a, there's a figure in the book who is uh, a candidate and later a president. Um, and um, yet the book for me is so much more about dealing with whatever... I and our and everybody, all of our contribution was to this damage that we're in right now. And 
every, whether it was a, a thought or an action that we had or took, that, that somewhere in this, and it's sort of my feeling when I look back on the impact of movies, and you know, you, you idealize what, whatever the, the, the intent and the hope is on things, and then you have to wonder, if, if these things mattered, how did we get here? And and the, also the kind of the the level of buy-in to celebrityism and all of that stuff that's become, you know, I remember uh, a Springsteen concert years ago during the Bush years, and he said, "America, we've come a long way, and we're going back." And <laughs> and, and and now I just feel like. You know, we, we say it can't get any more shallow. It can't get any worse. And at a certain point, that's going to be really true. And if we don't recognize how soon that is, we're in a lot of trouble. So I think it's, this is just a result. This guy is a result of something that we've all been contributing to the development of for a long a time. A symptom. Yeah. What are the chances this book will become a film with Sean Penn as Bob Honey? Um, <laughs> there, this is just the rhythm of you saying that reminded me of this, <laughs> this when Brendan Bean came off a plane <laughs> and he had been on the wagon in Dublin and they got there's newsreel footage of this and he was coming for the opening of one of his plays and they and, and he said, uh, you know, Mr. B, and we understand you've been on the wagon. Is there any chance while you're in New York that you'll go off the wagon? And he says, every chance in the world. <laughs> but mine's the opposite answer, is that in this case, if this was ever a movie, it would be because a director who liked it and who I thought was a good director wanted to make it. And then I would just wait, would watch it once for those two hours. And, and, and then that would be it. I wouldn't want a participation in it in any other way. If you had writer's block during the creation of this novel, what helped? Do you believe in writer's block? That's, that's my add-on. I've been waiting. I think I probably had a thought about something like a novel at the age of seven. So with 50 years of stored up, I want to write a novel. <laughs> I, I don't anticipate it for a while. OK, we have two questions to go. Um, do you think we have a true democracy in the United States? If not, does it exist anywhere? Please don't try to be politically correct. Well, we never claim to have a true democracy. We have a rep republic. That's why we have an electoral college system. That's why we're where we are. Um, <laughs> the, um, look, I, I don't know what the true best system is. I only know that the best parts of the democratic experience experiment are the best experiment going. But within that experiment, we're also looking at the capitalist experiment. And you have to look at the best of the socialist experiment. You know, I think until we figure out that, you know, it's not okay to sh shoot each other and blow each other up, and it's not okay to, um, y you know, just everything, that money is the, is the final thing, uh, and that's going to have to come from young people who don't have money. You know, they're the ones who are going to have to tell us how to do that, because who the F would I be, right? So um, I think, and what gives me a lot of hope is, you know, these, forget about anything to do with, and I'm all for the Second Amendment and this and this, whatever anybody's position is, but those kids under that kind of incredible horror, to come out within two days and be so articulate and so compl and so inclusionary, that's where you have to say, you know what? Far be it for me to say there's no hope. That's such a nice note that I think that's the note that we should end on. Let's do it. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah.